Hi guys, Lazy Masquerade here. This is actually sort of a minigame crossover special. You're about to hear four true horror stories, narrated by myself, and, as some of you may be aware, one of them is a personal story sent in by either Dr. Horror or Bee Buster, two other popular YouTube horror channels. Try to work out which one it could be, and to who it happened to. On one of their channels, you'll also find one of my personal scary experiences. So, after you're done listening to this video, why not go over to their channels and try to work out which one is mine? You'd be barking mad not to. Now, on with the show. Number one. I'm very close to my younger cousin. We've been more like brothers than cousins our whole lives. Anyways, when I was around nine and my cousin was seven, my cousin and his family moved to Waterbury, Connecticut. This was farther from us than they had been living before, but still relatively close, about 45 minutes or so. I used to spend every other weekend at his house, and he'd spend the other weekends at mine. During the summer, we'd spend half of it at his house and half at mine. I'm sure our parents always hated having an extra kid, but whatever. My cousin had made a friend with a boy, Todd, who lived just two houses down from him. He was a nice kid, friendly and funny. He was about four years older than me, and six years older than my cousin. Initially, he was a little off, but nothing that seemed like a warning sign to my nine-year-old brain. It was a little strange to me that he wanted to hang out with kids so much younger than him, my aunt talked with his parents and the neighbours though, and they assured her that he meant no harm. He was just never one to make many friends, and didn't know anyone else in the neighbourhood. Now, when I say Todd was a little strange, what I mean is, he had a thing for wild animals. He said he liked to nurse them back to health. He always had some injured animal that he was taking care of. We often wondered if he was hurting the animals and then nursing them back but nothing really suggested that he was. It was just kind of weird that he always found so many wounded animals. As the years went by, Todd got stranger and stranger. At one point, he gave my cousin a squirrel he'd captured as a pet. The next day, the squirrel was gone, only to turn up at Todd's house with half its tail missing. Todd was upset with my cousin for letting this happen, but all my cousin did was leave him in the cage that Todd had given him. A week later, Todd came to my cousin's house, carrying a dead squirrel, screaming at us for killing it. We never touched it. As I said, I was a few years older than my cousin, and was already going through puberty, which meant I'd already discovered the great thing that you can do when you're alone. My cousin had not, so I assumed. Anyway, Todd had given my cousin some hand soap, and a handwritten instruction on how to get yourself off. He said that he would come over and show my cousin how to do it, but that it had to be when no one else was home. Thankfully, my cousin told me his plans, and I stopped him. That's just effed up. I eventually talked my cousin into telling his mother, my aunt. My aunt, obviously, was furious and went over and screamed at Todd and Todd's parents. Shortly after that incident, my aunt and cousins moved in with my grandparents. They lived in Waterbury for a little over two years, and moved out in 1994. About three years later, Todd Rizzo was arrested for murdering a 13-year-old boy, and is currently on death row here in Connecticut. He wanted to know how it felt to kill someone. For those with a sense of morbid curiosity, the user has posted a link to Google Street View. The yellow house is the one that his cousin lived in. If you turn the camera around, there are a couple of duplexes on the other side of the street. If the user's memory serves, Todd lived in the peach one that is right and diagonal from his cousin's house. He has also included a link to Google Street View to show you the general area of where the little boy's body was found.
Number two. When I was 14, my dad and I lived in a small studio apartment on Hollywood Beach in Florida. We didn't have much money, but we treated ourselves to a takeout every other Thursday night from the same Chinese place a few blocks away. They were family run, so the same guy delivered the food every time. We found out later he was the adult son of the woman who owned the restaurant. It was my job every Thursday to answer the door and pay for the food, while my dad found something on the TV for us to watch while we ate. And never once did this unassuming Asian guy give me a reason to feel uncomfortable. He was short and tan, with grey hair and glasses. I was friendly, but not talkative. At 14, I was still in that shy stage. We never had a conversation, other than the typical hello and have a nice day. During that time, I was left home alone a lot. Both my dad and I felt that 14 was old enough to spend a few hours home alone in the afternoons after school. I was also very close with the woman who lived next door and her goddaughter, so I would spend a lot of time over there when my dad wasn't home. I walked home from school as well, and it was one school day afternoon, an hour or so after I had gotten home, that the phone rang. This was about 2004, so having a house phone was still pretty common. Ours was set up on the side table in the main room of the studio apartment. I answered it, and for a second, I thought there was going to be no one on the other end, because there was a long pause. Then there was a sort of stammering that I couldn't understand. Then the person said, This is Alan which was barely understandable because of the heavy Asian accent. I say Asian because I'm not sure if it's okay to assume they were Chinese just because they ran a Chinese restaurant. By now, you obviously know that Alan is the Chinese delivery guy. But at this point, at 14 years old, I was confused. Who the hell was Alan? I say something along the lines of, um, what? And he clarifies. Your delivery guy. Chinese delivery. Now I'm even more confused. What does Alan, the delivery guy, want? He goes on. Um, did you, uh, order food? No, we did not. And I tell him so. He's quiet for another second or so. And then he says, Are, uh... Are you home alone? My heart dropped into my stomach. Now I'm pretty sure I know what Alan, the delivery guy, wants. And yes, I was home alone. But I wasn't about to let him know that. My first instinct was to tell him that my dad was home. But his work van wasn't outside, and I realised that Alan had been to our house enough over the last few years to know my dad's van, and if he drove by, he would know that he wasn't home. My uncle is here, I said, but I immediately knew that it was a horrible attempt at a lie and that Alan is going to know that. So I challenge him. Why? He's quiet again for a moment. Then a statement, not a question. You are home alone. I'm stunned and have no idea what to say now. As I'm trying to think of something, he says, never mind, and hangs up. I'm so weirded out and scared at this point, that even though part of me thinks I actually scared him out of whatever he had planned, another part of me says to go and lock all the doors. So I do, front and back. By the time I get back to the front room from locking the back door, I look out the front window and see a car parked in the driveway. It's Alan, just sitting in his car. The windows are rolled up and lightly tinted, but I can see him behind the steering wheel, just staring at my front door. Thirty seconds later, the house phone starts ringing again. I don't answer it. Alan stays parked in the driveway for about five more minutes. I stand looking out the window the whole time, thinking to myself that the second he got out of the car, 
I was going to grab a knife from the kitchen. The house phone starts to ring one last time. I don't answer it. As soon as it stops ringing, I pick it up and dial 911. I was terrified, but not because of Alan. I was afraid my dad was going to be angry at me for calling the police. It's a completely different story, but he and the law have not always been on the same side, and I was raised with a sort of subliminal aversion to the police, and the idea that anything I couldn't handle myself, my dad could handle for me. Alan drove away while I was on the phone to the 911 operator. I was in the middle of telling her that he was calling the house and parked in the driveway, when he just put the car in reverse and sped down the street. The police took a statement from me when they got to my house, and then sent me next door to hang out with my neighbour and her goddaughter. We sat on the front porch and I told her the whole story of what happened, while the officers went down to the restaurant to talk to Alan and contact my dad. In the end, Alan was able to get off with a warning, by telling the officers that there was a confusion, and he thought that we had ordered food, which his mother confirmed. When asked why he wanted to know why I was home alone, he said he was trying to get an adult on the phone. The police told them that they would have to get someone else to make deliveries to customers in my area from now on, and to make sure that Alan keeps his distance. In all honesty, I think it was my dad's phone call to the restaurant later that really made Alan realise how much he had fucked up, and not the warning from the cops. He was fuming when I told him the story, as I imagine most fathers would be. He called the restaurant and spoke to the woman who owned the place, and then somehow convinced her to put Alan on the phone. What followed was one of the greatest conversations I have ever heard, even if it was only my dad's side that I was hearing. Nothing makes you feel more loved than your dad in macho protection mode. My dad was throwing insults I'd never even heard before, and I was in middle school, a kingdom of insult connoisseurs. I knew it was a very serious situation, and I knew that my dad was really angry, but I was in the background, stifling my laughter into a pillow. At one point, my dad asked Alan what the fuck he was thinking, driving over here, to which Alan responded something about being lonely, and my dad said, If I ever catch you on this street again, Alan, if I ever hear that you are near this street, I will make sure that you are lonely for the rest of your life by ripping your fucking dick off and choking you with it. We stopped eating Chinese food after that. Number 3 I have always had an innate fear of the night. As a child, my imagination was overcome with stories of creatures that come alive at night, and the safety offered by a house and light. I never had anything to base this fear on, until a night when I decided to go out with a buddy of mine to a baseball game, and got stuck at a light at 2am, after dropping him off at home. Of course, that night, the game went into extra innings, and so I didn't get a chance to drop my friend off back home until well after 1am. Everything was fine on the way home, until I hit a light right before the street that led to my house. It was a T-junction, and I was turning left. The light itself is one of those that you think is broken, until it finally turns green right before you finally decide to just run it. Of course, I turned up just as the light was turning red. I would have just run the light, seeing as no one was there, and it was closing in on 2am on a school night. But earlier that week, I had heard the phrase, Character is what you do when no one is looking. And for whatever reason, that was the night I decided to prove to myself that I was a man of character. Big mistake. I pulled to a stop at the light, feeling good about myself, bordering on self-righteous. When I happened to look out my window to my left, and noticed a lady sitting all alone on a bus bench. We made brief eye contact, and I quickly looked away. It was too late. I could see movement out of my peripheral vision, and I knew that she was coming my way. I looked out the window, and noticed she was carrying a bag. 
I quickly checked that my doors were locked and all my windows were up. I then moved my right foot above the accelerator just in case and braced myself for what was about to come. I was hoping it was just going to be an awkward exchange and was praying for a quick light change before she reached me so I could just get the hell out of there. I knew there was a slim chance of that. She walked right up to my window, put down her bag, and began to tap on my window. I nervously looked up at her, and she motioned for me to wind down my window. I had automatic windows, so I just imagined pushing the button too hard, and the window just coming all the way down, so I took a deep breath and lightly flicked it with my finger. The window moved microscopically down, but she didn't seem to notice or care. She then leaned in and began to talk. She said, My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? I should stop and give a brief physical description of the bag lady. She was small and skinny and of indeterminate age. She was either in her mid-twenties and had lived a hard twenty-plus years on the street, or she was a sixty-something-year-old who had been living a moderately hard life on the street. All that to say, just by looking at her, there was no way to verify her story. She looked beat up by life, and not just by her boyfriend. But there was something very strange about her delivery of this sentence. It was robotic, and seemed practiced, and like she was disconnected from the moment. That made my skin crawl, and after a brief debate in my head on whether I should do it, I told her that I had to get home and I could not give her a ride. After my first refusal, she leaned in even closer and said the same thing again. My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? This time, I felt more confident when I declined to give her a ride and told her that I had a curfew and I had to get home. She leaned in a third time, and began her statement again. My boyfriend beat me up. At this point, the light changed. I slowly lifted my foot off the brake, and started slowly rolling forward, and began muttering an apology. She didn't move. She just looked at the light, then looked down at me, leaned in closer, and said five words that have haunted me ever since. You made the right decision. Then she picked up her bag and walked back towards the bench. I peeled out of the intersection and cried and screamed all the way home. I have no idea what she was planning on doing, or if there were people waiting to jump me in my car from the bushes had I moved to let her in. But that encounter has haunted me ever since and has confirmed in my mind that nothing good happens after dark. Number 4 My mum, brother and I had finally arrived at my grandmother's house after a very boring seven hour drive. It was a trip we made every year, but not usually around this time. We'd always usually visit around Christmas, but this time it was October, the 18th to be exact. What seemed like 50 or more pumpkins with card faces adorned my grandma's porch. Halloween has always been my favourite holiday, so I was excited to see that my grandma had made such an effort to celebrate the occasion. We unloaded the car and made our way up the creaking stairs into the near 50-year-old house that my grandparents had built. We were met immediately with the smell of freshly baked apple pie and my grandmother giving us all hugs. She told us not to get too comfortable because we would be taking a small walk down the street. I thought it was rather strange that she wanted to go on a walk, seeing as it was already getting dark around this time. But I didn't want to appear rude, so I just nodded my head and replied, okay, sounds good. She led us down the gravel driveway, and we began walking down the street. The neighbourhood itself was in disrepair, and there were a number of vacant and decaying houses. 
We had ventured a couple of blocks, when she stopped in front of a two-story, obviously abandoned house with a green roof. The place looked like it should almost be considered condemned, as it didn't look safe to even go in. It was a white house, but it had dirt and mud seemingly caked all over the outside, and the wooden porch looked ready to collapse at any time. I could see a few other people arriving to the property on foot, when my grandmother announced to us that it was actually a haunted house that had been set up by a man living in the neighbourhood for Halloween. She said it was the first night that the house would be open to the public, and that it should be opening any moment, as it was now completely dark outside. A huge grin spread across my face. I loved haunted houses, even the ones that are just for entertainment purposes and are not actually haunted. Almost immediately after she'd finished talking, a tall, grungy-looking man exited the house and asked everyone to gather at the front porch. He then proceeded to inform us that he would be leading us into the house and to follow him. We all complied and began walking up the dilapidated steps into the home. We were met by an extremely nauseating stench. I don't really know how to describe it other than it was the most god-awful, overpowering, eye-watering, inducing smell I had ever encountered. We continued following the man. He appeared to be leading us downstairs and into the basement. I remember thinking that was strange, as this was supposed to be a haunted house, not a haunted basement. He threw open the door to the basement, and the smell that I had previously thought was the worst smell my nose had ever had the misfortune to breathe in, now seemed like nothing more than child's play. There were a couple of people who even began to gag at the smell. We couldn't see much of anything inside. At least not yet. The man flipped a switch that dimly lit the room. This basement seemed larger than any basement I'd ever seen. We made our way all the way down the stairs and just stopped in the middle of the room. The man then put his arm out, and sort of pointed towards the wall, and began to turn in a circle, as if to profoundly display what he was hanging on the walls. There were fake dead bodies hung on crucifixes all over the walls. My mum moved closer to inspect, and I moved with her. She got very close to one of the bodies, and moved her hand to touch the corpse's hand. I remember the look on her face after touching it. She seemed terrified. She grabbed me by the collar of my shirt and ran towards the door, shoving the rest of my family in front of her and pushing us up the stairs and out of the door. I could hear, as we were running to the front door, the rest of the people that entered with us now also quickly exiting the room. Once outside, my mum whipped out her phone and dialed 911, as did seemingly all the other people in the group, as they also pulled out their cell phones. The police seemed to arrive almost instantaneously. They must have had a car nearby or something. They entered the house, and walked out with the man in handcuffs. Other police cars had arrived by this point, enough so that they lined the entire block. They ended up taking the man away in a car, and a few officers stayed behind to take written statements from the people who had entered the house. I later found out that the man's name was Donald Van. He was a serial killer, who they had been searching for for almost ten years, and the bodies in the house were very much real. I sometimes wonder if we were meant to be his next victims, or if he was just proudly showing off his work to us. One thing I do know, though, is that I'll never forget that smell. It's almost like it's burned into my nose. Links to articles about this event can be found in the description below. Hi guys, Lazy Masquerade here again. So, as I said at the beginning of this video, one of these particular stories was actually a personal experience sent in by another popular horror channel, and in this case that was the one and only Dr. Horror. 
Uh, if you want a few more seconds to guess which of these stories was his entry, then pause the video now because I'm about to reveal the answer. Tick tock, tick tock, okay, I think that's enough time. And the story that was Dr. Horrors, uh, the one that he sent me, was in fact the last story. Um, yeah, he was among the actual people who went into Donald Van's infamous haunted house. And that's kind of uh, freaky to think about, actually. So, um, yeah. <laughs> if you want to check out which uh, was my personal scary experience, then make sure to check out either Dr. Horrors or Bee Buster's channels, as it's hidden amongst some of those stories in a similar mini-game style video to this one. So make sure to check them both out. Uh, links in the description below. Uh, so try and work it out. Uh, also, holy agroly, the uh, Lazy Legion has hit 100,000 recruits. <laughs> and that is uh, seriously crazy, guys. Thank you so much to everyone who has helped me so far to reach this milestone. And I'm going to make a special thank you video in the next couple of days to thank you for that. Uh, and also a major thank you again to Anthony Salinas uh, for all the artwork that he's provided for me uh, during these months that I've been working on these videos. His stuff is seriously second to none and I really do believe that he makes the best thumbnails going on YouTube. So make sure to check him out, check out all his stuff via the links in the description as well. And you will hear from me again very very soon. So until then guys, take care, stay spooky, and remember... The best things happen in the dark.